Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fourth event in the Equality Bahamas' series, the CEDAW Convention Speaker Series, where we are taking an in-depth look at the CEDAW Convention, going one article at a time so that we get a really great understanding of what the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women really means and what is expected of states, as well as the way that the committee looks at these articles and assesses states. Um, every four years. This series started as the Bahamas approaches its 30th anniversary of ratification and Equality Bahamas thought it would be a great idea to help people to understand this, this mechanism and how we can actually use it on the ground in our engagement with the government and in our push for an expansion of women's rights and moving toward gender equality and having gender justice. We are really fortunate to be working with Marion Bethel, who is a Bahamian, an attorney at law, and a member of the CEDAW committee, who has been helping us to make connections with the experts. And today we are joined by Bandana Rana, and Marion will tell us a little bit more about her now, and then we will get started. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Alicia, for it that. Um, and greetings from the Bahamas. I'm really glad to be here. Um, uh, with you today. It's morning time here, and I know it's different times around the world. Um, I just want to, first of all, give a, a real shout out to Equality, <laughs> Equality Bahamas, um, which is doing, in my view, groundbreaking work in the Bahamas, regionally and internationally, on um, women's human rights and um, social justice issues. And I particularly want to highlight Alicia Wallace's role and her leadership and her team for staying the course. I mean, you are doing the kind of, of um, work that is, is transformative and that is what we're, 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 we're aiming for. And it takes time, it takes commitment and you are staying the course doing this kind of work. And so I am really proud to be um, a strong supporter and member of Equality Bahamas and so glad that, that um, you're doing this series on the CEDAW committee. So yes, I am a mem current member of the CEDAW committee and um, I want to welcome my friend, my dear friend, Bandana and just thank her so much for um, agreeing to, to be a part of this uh, series, which is so important um, to us and for doing this particular topic on gender stereotyping. So um, Bandon and I have been on the committee now since 2017 together. We were elected together and we're still there. And um, Bandana has brought such um, incredible um, advocacy from the NGO sector to the committee and has, has just, you know, really um, fueled that for us in terms of NGO advocacy and her commitment to NGO advocacy and how important it is for the work that we do. Um, she's also very um, committed to women, peace and security issues, which is one of the um, beacons that, that she, beacons of light that she brings to the committee and um, keeps us focused on that and um, has been very instrumental in um, the agenda for women, peace and security around the world. And so I am really um, honored that, uh, to, to be with her in this way and to, to learn from her work on women, peace and, and security issues. Um, Bannon also um, understands really well the uh, national gender, uh, national women's machinery machineries around the world in terms of how our, our countries use um, uh, women's platforms and women's machineries to, to, to advance the work of, of the CEDAW, of the CEDAW convention. And so I really um, am honored to be here with you, Bandana, and so glad that you agreed to do this with us. And so Bandana is from Nepal and is a member of the, of the committee since 2017, and currently the chair of the working group on inquiries in the committee. She has served as vice chair of the CEDAW committee from 2018 to 2020. And she is also currently a member of the United Nations Population Fund High Level Commission. Um, and her experience spans three decades of active engagement in promoting women's rights and gender equality through the different organizations and networks she has founded and led. She has worked from the grassroots to the national, regional, and global level, leading advocacy, research, and public outreach and community mobilization programs. Bandana's many years of dedicated work 
have been in the area of violence against women, gendered conflict transformation, peace building, and engendered media, particularly through the two organizations she co-founded and led, Sati and Sancharika Samuha in Nepal. She is the former chair of the National Women's Commission of Nepal. Bandana is the recipient of the Woman of Distinction Award 2016, conferred by the NGO CSW Committee for her dedicated work and contribution to gender equality globally. She is also, was, was also a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Group for the Global Study on the Implementation of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 which addresses the issue of women, peace and security. She was a member of the UN Women Global Civil Society Advisory Group from 2012 to 2015. Uh, she is the chair of the board of directors of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders and former chair of the Global Network of Women Shelters. Welcome, Bandana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. I'm truly humbled with the very detailed introduction uh, that you have uh, presented, but I am very honored to be working with Marion, you know. We, are, we belong to two, uh, you know, farthest corners of the world, but I think we connect very well in the committee. As Marion said, we both got elected uh, together and re-elected again together for our second term. And uh, I think we share um, a, a very special bonding in terms of experiences, friendship, camaraderie, everything. So I'm very, very pleased and honored uh, to, to, to be uh, joining this very uh, CEDAR, CEDAR convention speaker series at the recommendation of Marion, who speaks highly of Equality Bahamas. So congratulations to Equality Bahamas for organizing this speaker series. As you said, I would like to congratulate you for your 30 years of ratification of the convention, but also because it's significant because it's 40 years of CEDAW as well. So, so thank you so much for, uh, for this. It's an honor. Uh, to join this, um, um, you know, this this speaker series, um, uh, and uh, and my warm warm greetings from Nepal, which is uh, you know we are I think we are twelve hours um, uh, more than that uh, you know uh, it's it's eight p.m. over here, uh, so very very warm greetings. Um, I I did see a bit. I know my former uh, members from the CEDAW committee or the former speakers who joined your. Um, uh, speaker series have already shared with you regarding article one and two, three, as well as four. And I had uh, the opportunity to see a bit of what they presented uh, and they are the legal experts. So they have, uh, they have uh, shared with you already the most, most of it uh, re regarding the legalization legislations, legal aspects, which has been covered very well by them as, 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 uh, as I saw. Uh, so my, my sharing of Article 5, as has been requested, I'm very happy to share my experiences of Article 5 and what it means to um, me as well as, uh, you know, based on my work, but also as, uh, as a civil society advocating for addressing stereotypes, prejudice, promoting gender equality, how important Article 5 is. That is what I would like to highlight. Uh, based on more on my, uh, more on my uh, experiences uh, in advocating uh, for gender equality, as, as has been said, you know, at the national level, at the regional and global level, and also uh, as a civil society, the role of civil society in using these mechanisms uh, to advocate, you know, to, 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 to be a watchdog, to strengthen accountability of governments, I think so. I will be sharing more on those aspects. Um, I'm glad to be addressing Article Five because, uh, as Marion has said, you know, my my work has been basically uh, for the last three decades based on violence against women, addressing violence against women, the different forms of violence against women, um, uh, working directly with survivors of violence, founding shelters for violence against uh, violence survivors from violence. Um, advocating, uh, lobbying for um, uh, legislation changes, adoption of legislations from in Nepal in terms of the domestic violence law, gender equality law, uh, other, other laws related to harmful traditional practices, 
So that is what has been my um, area and how I have uh, used, um, you know, this uh, Article 5 um, in, in promoting um, gender equality. So basically, I, as I go through my presentation, I will be also sharing uh, some, uh, you know, uh, highlights of, of my own experiences in using Article 5. First, uh, as, I, as, as my, the previous speakers have already explained wow, what CEDAW is and the different uh, definitions uh, or the articles from one to three and four, I just wanted to share a little bit and also the three aspects of you know, non-discrimination, state accountability and substantive equality. I think the last speaker covered that as well. I might pick it in bits and pieces uh, as I go about uh, you know, in my presentation, but I wanted to start off by saying why CEDAW matters? Why is CEDAW important? For me, someone who's come from, as I said, as an advocate for gender equality for the last three decades, we in Nepal, there are numerous examples of how CEDAW has been most instrumental in intensifying our advocacy for bringing about necessary policy changes, adoption of different laws, even in engendering a new constitution, we have a new constitution since 2015, uh, and CEDAW has been one of the most um, powerful tool for advocacy. So we consider it important because one, our country has ratified as Bahamas, so Nepal ratified CEDAW in 1991. And um, uh, you know, state parties are obligated to report to the CEDAW committee every four years on the progress that has been made. So every state party, no matter what, has an objective to progress rather than regress. And in that terms, when civil societies are watchdogs and present, um, uh, create that pressure for the changes based on the recommendations given by CEDAW committee, it becomes a very powerful um, uh, tool for advocacy to bring about those changes. So that is why I think personally for me, CEDAW, bef even before I was a member of the CEDAW committee, have used, in fact, it is because I was interested excuse me, my throat is a little bit, you know, so that is the reason <coughs> uh, that, that CEDAW has been important. But I wanted to also say why CEDAW matters is because it's a powerful international human rights instrument that reflects a global determination to achieve gender equality through advancing women's rights. One of the core, it is one of the, you know, out of the nine core international human rights treaties. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me, I have a bad throat. I'm going to take a medicine that will soothe my throat and I hope I can carry on. So out of the nine core international human rights treaties, it's one of the key treaty or the core treaty which requires member states to undertake legal obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of women. It is exclusively devoted to gender equality, one of the key elements of the Sustainable Development Goals. It provides a complete definition of sex-based discrimination and sets out a comprehensive set of rights for women in civil, political, economic, social and cultural fields and maps out the broad range of activities that must be taken to achieve this equality. It is based on the principle of substantive equality or equality in results between men and women. And this is what I find the most important part. You know, you might have laws, policies, which are best, but unless and until it brings about the change um, uh, uh, that is desired, at the, um, you know, in, in, in the lives of women, no laws or policies are of any use. So I think the substantive equality essence of CEDAW is extremely important when we address prejudice, when we address stereotypes. And it recognizes that discrimination is often most deeply rooted in spheres of life, such as culture, very strongly, you know, many state parties 
defend many of the actions on the basis of culture, but it is not static, it needs to change. Family and interpersonal relations and addresses the negative impact of gender stereotyping. It's again, why it matters, because it's a powerful tool for advocacy and lobbying as demonstrated by women activists across the world. And I would like to do, um, um, re-emphasize Article 1 of CEDAW, which defines discrimination, which is what elaborates Article 5, the stereotype. You know, it's in the premise of Article 1. How does CEDAW define discrimination? It's any distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women, irrespective of their marital status, on a basis of equality of men and women, of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. This is Article 1, and it is how discrimination is defined by CEDAW. Discrimination CEDAW considers is at the root of all forms of deprivation. And in order to ensure realization of fundamental freedoms and human rights, it is critical to eliminate discrimination against women in all forms, in all fields, in both the private and public arenas for the realization of equality between men and women. Discrimination against women is still deeply rooted in spheres of life such as culture, family, and interpersonal relations. I want to emphasize here patriarchal attitudes and deep-rooted practices regarding the roles and responsibilities of women and men in family and the society help legitimize discrimination against women and underlie women's disadvantaged position in areas such as education, employment, and public and political life. So I, I think this is what is the root cause of violence against women, a problem that is significant widely spread. Just to give you an example of my, you know, I, I grew up in Nepal, considerably a middle-class family, um, uh, as the eldest um, daughter and um, having three other siblings as well. But uh, just to let you know how, how it legitimizes in the family, the stereotypical nature, you know, in a patriarchal society, I, rem I recall my mother always saying, if I, if I slept beyond 7 a.m. in the morning, she would be, oh, a girl can't sleep so late, can't get up so late, you have to get up early. What, do we, what are you going to do when you get married and go to your husband's house? Whereas my brother would be soundly asleep, peacefully asleep, you know? So I think, I think the image that is, that the girl needs to get up early, learn kitchen work, uh, be able to please her in-laws when she gets married and goes to her husband's house, be able to cook well so that the husband is satisfied and happy, and also be seen but not heard. Don't shout too much. Don't laugh too much. Uh, um, sit down in a proper manner. I'm sure we can connect that, though we belong to two different continents. I'm sure we have those, you know, those, those, those kinds of experiences. And in a way, you tend to grow that way. You know, you don't even question it because um, it legitimizes that that is the role of a girl. You know, that is the role of a woman. So I, I, I have, I grew up that way. You know, I don't, I never grew up as a rebel or an activist, but it's just the experiences later on that I was exposed to in my career, in my profession, in my education, that I became a passionate gender advocate. And within the committee, I passionately address usually most of the time in article five in our constructive dialogue with uh, governments. So article five, I consider extremely important because all the other substantive articles from article one to 16, if you look at it, if we do not address stereotypes, whether it is education, access to health services, employment, uh, you might have the best um, policies in paper, but unless and until uh, people in power, which are mostly men, internalize um, and get rid of this, this um, persistent, resilient stereotyping, uh, you will not achieve gender equality. So 
So though Article 5 is important, but it's a cross-cutting article uh, that touches every other article. You know, that's, that's what I think. But just to emphasize on what does Article 5 say, there are two um, uh, sub um, articles A and B under Article 5. It encourages state parties to work towards the elimination of stereotypes and instructs states to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women with a view to achieving the elimination of prejudices and customary and all other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority or the superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotyped roles for men and women. That's A and in B, to ensure that family education includes a proper understanding of maternity as a social function and the recognition of the common responsibility of men and women in the upbringing and development of their children, it being understood that the interest of the children is the primordial consideration in all cases. So these are the two um, um, uh, sub-articles that, that is under Article 5 uh, in the convention, which addresses stereotypes and prejudice. I just want to elaborate that a bit further. What are the specific areas covered by the first section of Article 5? It's depiction of men and women in stereotypical gender roles or characteristics have the potential to cause harm in media and advertising. Now, most media advertising, you might, um, uh, I mean, I haven't followed the Bohemian media, but in most of the media, or even the news items, or any other media programs, um, the decision makers are men. Uh, the women are mostly confined to the home or the kitchen. Uh, if there are advertisements to sell products, the women's sexuality is pronounced. You know, women are pretty, their different parts of their sexuality are pronounced you know, so much. Uh, so, so the media plays a strong impact. Uh, I do recall uh, in my early teenage, you know, the, uh, there was no, no such media as social media now, but we had um, Bollywood films, we call the Hindi films, you know, and Nepal is uh, next to India and you, um, Bollywood popular films are very popular with us. So I think it must have been the image of those films that uh, you, you know, in my early um, teens, I remember of course, to please my parents, because we were studying, you would say, what do you want to be? You would either say a doctor and engineers, which was the most significant you know, profession that was known to be. But secretly in my early teen age, I started dreaming of getting married, then you don't need to study and just looking pretty, uh, you know, helping my, uh, helping your husband uh, to go to office in the morning, cooking good food. And when the husband comes back, um, uh, you know, and this is all, in the Hindi films, you know, how just before the husband comes back, you just look pretty, look in the mirror, put on your tikka and your, um, you know, bangles like these. And, uh, and uh, when the husband enters, you know, take the briefcase, take off, help him to take off his uh, uh, coat and uh, feed him well. So as a, as a teenager, I had that secret image also, you know, so it, the media plays a very, very strong role in, in determining uh, young girls and men's role in the society. So that is what Article 5 also um, um, uh, depicts, also portrays. How does the media, the advertisements portray men and women that it should not be um, re-emphasizing or reiterating the stereotypical traditional role? That's an article, article 5. The cultural, customary, and religious practices that impede women's human rights. In Nepal and in some of the South Asian countries, menstruation is a taboo. When you menstruate, you have to confine yourself to a room and not touch anyone. You are supposed to be inferior at that time. I remember my first menstruation and I wasn't prepared because I was the eldest daughter. Uh, my mother didn't, uh, at that time, we didn't have much communication with our parents. So perhaps she thought it will come automatically. So I was just totally unprepared when I had my first menstruation. 
when my mother discovered that and she said, oh, you are menstruating, you now need to, for the first menstruation, you need to confine in a dark room, no looking at the sun um, uh, for 21 days. And the reason that was given to me was because the sun and, the, and no looking at any male members, neither my father or the brothers. And the, and the explanation that was given to my young mind was that the sun and the uh, male are superior, they're powerful. And at this time of menstruation, you are inferior, uh, you know, so you cannot um, cast your shadow also to them. They should not be seen. They will be, uh, they will be tarnished with your image. That was the explanation given to me. And I know when I was confined for 21 days in this dark room, I, when I came out, I wasn't the same. I was very, uh, comp I had an inferiority complex. I thought I was completely different from my brother. I never started sharing the same rapport with my brother and my father. So cultural taboos, religious taboos, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just giving one example of menstruation. And even in Nepal, in some rural areas in far Western, you might have heard, Girls are isolated in a cow shed for four days, a very uh, small, uh, low cow shed where they are vulnerable to sexual exploitation, even being attacked and killed and uh, attacked from wild animals. Also, there are examples of how they have been killed many times. So this is what stereotypically religious, cultural, uh, customary uh, practices also um, 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 strengthen stereotypes. Fundamental attitudes and stereotypes that marginalize women in public and private spheres. And um, social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women based on the idea of the inferiority or the superiority of either of the sexes or in stereotyped roles for men and women. It emphasizes the role of social and cultural patterns of conduct and the importance of eliminating gender stereotypes to achieve equal rights for women. The second part of Article 5 requires that family education programs contain a proper understanding of maternity as a social function and the recognition of the common responsibility of men and women in the upbringing and development of children. In, in our society, when you bear a child, again, the mother needs to be confined in a room for 11 days. She cannot be touched by her husband or anyone else, you know. That is the, and, and the husbands don't even look at the, uh, you know, are not encouraged to really rear children up. Even now, rearing a child is completely a woman's uh, domain. Uh, gradually, younger people, younger couples um, are gradually at a very slow level, you know, negligible uh, percentage of male actually engage in, 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 in sharing uh, the responsibilities of rearing a child or maturing a child. So that is what Article 5 also covers. Adopt education and public information programs, which will help eliminate prejudices and current practices that hinder the full operation of the principle of the social equality of women, deconstructing the ways in which governments define culture and use their definitions to justify discriminatory practices, attitudinal changes and behavioral patterns spanning a woman's entire life cycle, including civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, elimination of prejudices in customary and all other practices, and educational programs aimed at removing cultural stereotypes, developing primary education curricula, that eliminate gender-based stereotyping, making primary school curricula more gender sensitive, produces concrete and measurable results and has the potential for long range impact in eliminating cultural practices that affirm inferiority of women. When I talk about educational curriculum, one thing that reminds me, I have a young grandson and whenever um, uh, there is a school's parents day, you know, they have this special day where they are coached for two to three months for a drama or a presentation or an elocution. And, um, um, you know, my daughter has uh, raised her only son 
in a very gender, uh, gender equal kind of um, gender ba balanced uh, way. But I, I recall once my uh, six or seven years, six years maybe he was saying that, he, I don't know how he got, he said, but, but women are weak, you know, they do need men to protect them, you know. And I was really surprised, how did he get this? But when I went to this parents day, I recalled there is this drama where the, where the young boys are five or six year old, they are the prince, they come on a horse, and there's this frail princess and they rescue the princess, you know, the princess. Then I said, it is, you know, imagine a five-year-old boy for two months practicing for a parent's day means such an exciting thing for a child. Being ingrained with those traditional roles uh, uh, at, a, at a very tender age will be, will, will be so embedded in the mind. So that is where the young children get, oh, but women are weak. You know, girls are weak, they do need men, we are stronger. So there was a, there was a curriculum in Nepal where it says um, for class one, I think it's a primary school. My, my father goes to office, my mother stays at home. And there was one child who said, my mother also goes to office. Many mothers go to office now and they get wrong when they write that, you know, when the teacher corrects it. So it's, it's like, you do really need to change the curriculum. You know? So that is what um, we encourage state parties to do under Article 5. Under Article 5 is the key article where we address violence against women. We do, of course, address uh, laws related to violence against women, domestic law, its implementation, whether the country has a domestic violence law or not, how it is implemented, what impact it has had on the lives of women, whether there are shelters, support services, what about the access to support services, you know, information dissemination, uh, you know, hotline services, but we also address stereotypical roles, the role of the media, uh, the, the curriculum that needs to be changed, and what is a state party doing to do that, awareness raising programs, um, uh, uh, strategy plans and national action plans to address stereotypes, to address prejudice, Engaging men and boys are gradually becoming more and more we are addressing that. How do we engage men and boys, especially young boys, in addressing stereotypes and prejudice? And so we base our questions based on this um, area in, in our uh, dialogue with the state parties. But I just wanted to, I don't know what is the time. Let me look at the time also. Okay, I do seem to have some time, I guess. 10 minutes more, I guess. Uh, you, uh, then, you know, I just want to give you some samples of, of uh, what kind of recommendations we give to state parties. I haven't named any state parties. I'm just giving you a general glimpse of the kind of recommendations under Article 5 that we give to state parties. For example, address stereotypical attitudes about the roles and responsibilities of women and men, including the stereotypical cultural patterns and norms that perpetuate direct and indirect discrimination against women and girls in all areas of their lives. Develop and implement a comprehensive strategy across all sectors to eliminate discriminatory stereotypes on the roles and responsibilities of women and men in the family and in society. Develop and implement gender transformative programs targeting community and religious leaders teachers, girls and boys, and women and men to eliminate discriminatory stereotypes regarding the roles and responsibilities of women and men in the family and in society, and systematically measure the effect and impact of the strategic interventions undertaken. Work with a broad range of stakeholders, including women's organization, to dismantle discriminatory attitudes that perpetuate gender-based violence against women and discrimination, as well as harmful practices against women and girls, and in particular, against those who are lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, or women with disabilities. Develop, adopt, and implement national action plans I'll just give you the, the you know, we, we also encourage that um, strategies should be developed uh, to prevent prenatal sex selection 
to eradicate the practice of sex selection abortion. This is getting to be a huge problem in many parts of South Asia. Strengthen mandatory capacity building programs. For whom? For judges, prosecutors, police, social workers, psychologists, healthcare workers, on gender sensitive investigation and interrogation. Uh, capacity building of the media, partnership with the media, monitoring the media, um, and um, discouraging media on uh, objectification of women and to promote positive portrayals of women as active agents of development and positive and nonviolent masculinities. Uh, uh, and also adopt a community and school-based comprehensive strategy, engaging men and boys in creating an enabling environment that supports the empowerment of women and girls with the aim of tackling harmful practices and changing underlying social norms that underpin sexual violence and social norms. Design and implement gender education programs for the empowerment and autonomy of girls and adolescents on positive masculinities, including through revised school curricula, teacher and parenting education programs and media campaigns. We also address child marriage, effectively implement the prohibition of child marriage and strengthen awareness raising efforts regarding the harmful effects of child marriage on the health and development of girls. Educational campaigns on the negative impact on women's enjoyment of the human rights of discriminatory stereotypes associated with traditional gender roles in the family and in society. And this should target women and men as well as, well as girls and boys and awareness raising to promote equal sharing of domestic and childcare responsibilities as well as, as well as responsible fatherhood. So these are just some examples of um, uh, recommendations uh, that we have given to different state parties. I'm just presenting the general recommendations, but some of them are very specific to a state party uh, based on the assessment or the re progress report or the periodic report that they have submitted and um, our assessment of their alternative reports as well. So it can be very specific, but these are just uh, broader kind of recommendations that we give to state parties under Article 5. Now there's one good news that uh, I would like to share with you. As you know, CEDAW committee, you may know that CEDAW committee also issues general recommendations. I know some of the earlier speakers touched on general recommendations also, so before I go on what I'm presenting to you on this general recommendation, I want to just highlight what is a general recommendation. It's statements by the CEDAW committee about how different aspects of the convention should be interpreted. As you know, the CEDAW convention was, um, uh, came into effect in 1989 and um, uh, uh, it's been so many years. And sometimes the state parties, um, uh, interpret the articles based on their own understanding. So in order to provide a detailed guidance to state parties on what the CEDAW convention actually means, the CEDAW uh, committee can issue uh, general recommendations touching on a particular, uh, particular article uh, and, uh, and um, providing detailed guidance on what it means. Uh, it's an additional guidance to assist governments in their implementation of the convention. It includes an overview of, of the women's human rights concerns in that area, a close analysis of the ways in which CEDAW applies to these concerns, and a list of recommended measures for governments to implement. As well as, um, and, and to date, we have um, uh, 38 general recommendations. Presently, we are working on the general recommendation on the rights of indigenous women and girls. Hopefully it will get adopted in our next session in October uh, this year. Uh, the good news is as um, um, you know, Marion and I uh, have, uh, have uh, presented an initial concept note to the um, CEDAW committee on the need for a general recommendation on stereotypes, which is extremely important. And we are happy to, I'm happy to inform you that she and I will be uh, co-chairing 
the, the, the elaboration and the drafting of this general recommendation, hopefully, which will start from 2023, because the committee has um, um, agreed or decided that uh, we would work on this general recommendation starting from 2023. Now, why this GR on gender stereotypes? Because all those reasons which I have already outlined earlier, but because gender stereotyping is often not identified and understood as the cause of human rights violations against women. You know, the state parties understand drafting a law, fine, a policy, fine. They have a strategy plan there, national action plan there. But the stereotyping and, and the impact, the harmful impact it has on every aspect of women's lives is not understood by many at all. So we hope that this general recommendations will help um, everyone to understand that better. Harmful gender stereotypes and the practice of wrongful gender stereotyping are most often the root causes of discrimination faced by women. They are pervasive across all cultures and sectors of society and have proven stubbornly resilient over time. Harmful gender stereotypes and wrongful gender stereotyping affect the rights of women under the CEDAW convention and may entail violations of their rights to freedom of expression, of association, of conscience and belief, in addition to violation of their right to non-discrimination based on gender, gender and to equality with men. It's also needed to prioritize gender stereotypes and stereotyping as a significant and grave human rights issue and to increase the visibility of gender stereotyping and gender stereotypes and underscore its negative and harmful impact as a frequent cause of discrimination against women and girls. The scope of this proposed general recommendation is, it will deal with the obligation of state parties, particularly under article five. It will provide, but it will also, uh, you know, be dealt in conjunction with uh, its cross-cutting obligations with, uh, with the provisions of all other articles. It will provide specific guidance to state parties on legislative policy and other appropriate measures to address harmful gender stereotypes and eliminate wrong stereotyping. Highlight the effect of gender stereotyping and stereotypes in specific contexts, such as the discriminatory legislation, access to justice, law enforcement protocols, the judiciary and the media will address stereotypes experienced by women and girls with intersectional identities, such as ethnicity, disability, migration status, socioeconomic status, LBTI status, national origin, age, color, language, religion or belief, political opinion, marital status, urban rural location, health status, illiteracy, trafficking of women, armed conflict, being a refugee, internal displacement, statelessness, widowhood, and stigmatization of women fighting for their rights, including women human rights defenders. So we hope that this general recommendation when adopted will serve to raise awareness of gender stereotyping and stereotypes and the explicit and unrecognized ways this practice undermines the recognition, exercise, and enjoyment of women's human rights obligations under the CEDAW convention. So this is a general recommendation. We are hoping to start work from 2023 in collaboration with all stakeholders. Um, um, I'm happy to share that Marion and I hope to lead this uh, drafting. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, what is all about Article 5, but I would like to say that uh, uh, Article 5 is one of the key article uh, for all those civil society working on violence against women, working to promote gender equality, working to advo advocate for um, uh, policies and legislations. Uh, and uh, it will, it, at once this general recommendation is adopted, it's again going to be another powerful tool uh, for the civil society, as well as a special guidance for state parties to address uh, stereotyping and prejudice, which has, which potentially harms uh, the lives of women, not only from the birth, but even before the birth. 
you know, because uh, there's the sex selection practice that's going on. So I will stop here and I will be happy to respond to, or listen to your observations of Article 5. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bandana, for a great presentation. I really appreciated that you brought so many sort of real life examples of what stereotyping and prejudicing can, can, can look like in, in our real lives. And I think many of us have some examples too that, that we've seen and that we are still, still seeing. I put in the chat um, a part of the concluding observations um, of the CEDAW committee when it reviewed the Bahamas. And there are four main points and they really tie into a lot of what you were saying. So I'm, I'm wondering, when it comes to awareness raising campaigns, are there any that you have seen that have been really effective or are there any particular components that the committee thinks of that would be effective in addressing sorry. the issue of stereotypes? Sorry, Alicia, can you repeat the question? Sorry, yes. I was looking at the chat. And got it. When it comes to awareness raising campaigns, are there particular elements that would be especially helpful in addressing and, and combating gender stereotyping and prejudice? Well, there are, as I said, you know, more and more, we are recently addressing engaging men and boys, you know? So there are campaigns, I can, I can speak from my own experience because I have led a number of um, uh, media campaigns and public advocacy campaigns addressing gender equality and stereotyping. Let me share one example of, uh, you can hear me, right, Alicia? Yeah, so let me share one example of, we had um, initiated one joint um, campaign with um, um, the footballers, the All Nepal Football Association in Nepal. The reason was, uh, just to give you an example, the reason was in 2010, 2010, uh, in 2009, we adopted a domestic violence law. In, and I was, um, uh, you know, trying to mobilize and train community mobilizers, community women on the domestic violence law and its implementation. And I remember in far Midwestern Nepal, when I was doing a community me meeting, one woman stood up and she said, I know everything about the law. I'm an educated person. I know how to write a um, FIR to the police, how to, you know, but in spite of knowing all this, I am compelled to live in a violent relationship. And the reason is, if I um, file a complaint to the police, from tomorrow, I have to go to the police station every day. My husband will find out, and at least I have two meals now that my husband is providing. From the next day, he will kick me out of the house. The society will not look at me well because they'll say she has two children. How could she file a complaint to the uh, police? You know, she should have stayed. And I don't see that the law that you have developed is going to help me in any way because I'm not much educated. The government is not going to give me an uh, employment or there are no support services that the government will support me in this entire process. It might take years if I get a justice and even if I, I, I don't even have much faith in it. If you really want to make change, you know, these laws are not going to work. What you need to do is you need to come and educate the men in a house and change their mindsets change their attitudes. That is when maybe the law can, can be useful as well. But without changing the mindsets of men, no, no laws are going to change our lives. So that actually you know, was a calling for me, that we need to really look at how we can change the mindsets and attitudes because they've also grown up in that patriarchal society, you know, thinking that men are superior. So at that time, a football game was going on and I realized footballers, like all the media is concentrated in it. You know, that there's such a focus on people are bound to their TV, glued to the TV. And suddenly it struck to me that maybe we should approach the footballers. You know? But when we approached the footballers, they were initially very resistant. They said, why are they coming to us? They think we are aggressive, you know, that uh, we, are, we are the ones who are more the perpetrators. But it took some time, but then they joined, we joined hands and um, uh, we, 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 con we called our campaign, our goal, stop violence against women. So it's a G-O-A-L goal, you know? So it was a joint goal, uh, stop violence against women. So what they did, we had of course series of workshops because before we could uh, get their buy-in. But after that, they felt they were the ambassadors. We had t-shirts, real men, um, uh, respect um, women, you know, be a real man, those, those kinds of t-shirts. 
and they would carry this banner, our goal, stop violence against women before every national and international game. It was a, uh, it, it took a lot of series of dialogues and workshops with them, as I said, speaking their language, you know, um, fair play is the FIFA language. So I, we would have sessions where we'd say, do you believe in fair play? And they would say, of course, FIFA is their real thing. You know, of course we believe in fair play. Then we would say, if you believe in fair play, so fair play should not just be on the ground. Fair play should also be in the home, begin from home. So speaking their languages, taking out their languages, mm -hmm. knowing what do they understand better? What do they relate to? Finding uh, men, uh, players within them who had married a widow and they, had, they didn't know about that. You know, who had, who had uh, confronted his, one of the player's mother had, um, uh, his, his father had died and a mother needs to wear white, you know, totally white and stay secluded. He didn't want his mother to do that. So he, 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 uh, he you know, made his mother wear other colored clothes and he didn't want her to follow all those rituals. There were these stories, but which had never been picked up. So we tried to find those stories within them, you know? So uh, I remember one player, a national player, very famous, popular national player after a series of workshop came up and said, uh, ma'am, you know, my, my, both my wife and me, we work, we have a profession, but, and we share all household chores inside, you know, but, uh, but sometimes I cook, she would washes dishes, sometimes she washes clothes, but I never, I never used to go and dry the clothes in the open veranda because he lived in a congested place because the others would see him, the other guys would see him. What they did inside was very well, they shared every household responsibilities, but they, he didn't want the other boys to know about that, you know, to die. But after a series of workshops, he said, I feel that is a good point. You know, now I go and dry it publicly. And I have noticed over the months that a few other boys have also started doing this. And he's a national player. He's, he said this in the interviews so many times, you know. So I, I considered that campaign as a minimum investment, maximum mileage. One, because they are very popular uh, and idolized by the youth, young boys. Second, there's so much of media attention when they speak, when they take these banners. And um, uh, we really don't need to invest much if we get their buy-in. The buy-in is the most strongest part because then when they have footballs, tournaments, the media is always there covering all these, you know? So I, I consider this uh, one very good example of addressing stereotypes. And that example brings across really strongly um, how effective it can be when you use um, what is common to people, finding sort of common ground, like you were using the fair play and the play on the word goal as well for the yeah. football players, but also um, having, having champions, having people yeah. that other people look up to, to share this message. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions from participants? You can type your questions into the chat or you can raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to use your mic. We welcome your questions and comments. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in, um, Alicia here, Marion. Um, first of all, I just want to really thank Pandana for a very comprehensive, um, clear and um, relatable presentation and for really bringing in those very personal examples of, of how gender stereotyping affected you in the family and um, your own journey there. This, this has been really instructive and very, very helpful. Um, so a couple of things I, I just want to say and, and very briefly too. Um, I'm looking at Article 5 and I'm seeing so clearly that, you know, it talks about this issue of uh, family relations and education in the family. And, and this was crafted way back in 79 in the 70s and is just so, you know, relevant to today. And so I want to say that, you know, as we move forward in trying to understand gender stereotyping and how to address it, I think for me, um, I'm seeing that the family is really, you know, a, a major institution, social institution, where the problem is is emblematic and significant and harmful. And I'm I'm just trying to see how we are going to really 
um, address the issue of family relations because that is where patriarchy is most manifested in, in, in its very harmful, in very harmful ways. And women are, are inordinately affected by, by it in the home in terms of marital rape, in terms of domestic violence. Um, and so, and so the, the examples of using men and boys as, um, you know, targeting men and boys um, as, as, as part of our awareness raising, I think is really significant and very important. And, and I think we're moving in that direction for sure globally. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we've all grown up in a patriarchal society and we still are as individuals and as groups are trying to, to you know, address it, erase it from our own lives and how to do that. And so getting back to the family then, I think this is where women, and men are most um, affected by negative gender stereotypes, and and the question for me is how do we how do we, you know, have the kind of effective inroads into the family, which is which is which, uh, against which there are staunch you know rebuffs. I mean, the family is seen as the institution that you know is the center of, the, of 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 any country or any community, and therefore it needs to be inviolate and and it's it's sacred and all of that. And the church supports that, and so do educational institutions, and all, all social institutions support this notion of the um, the woman as the um, you know the man as the provider and, and the uh, leader of the household, etc. The woman as the, the 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 helper, even though women work and do other things. And so, I'm just trying to think of ways, um, including the one that you just um, put forward. Bandana as to how we are really going to um, address the family relations, the issue of maternity as a social function and what that means and, and, and how we um, empower women and men and boys and girls um, through this uh, gen general recommendation that we're gonna put forward in terms of gender stereotyping. Because I think what one of the things we want to avoid is, is setting up um, opposites, in other words, you know, women's rights are, are different from, from rights of the child, for example, within a family. And um, how, how do we bring all of that together to, to make sense and cohesion and justice for everybody within a family unit? Those are some of the thoughts I'm just trying to <laughs> yeah. work through. No, thank you, Marianne. I know this is a complex issue that we have been facing from, you know, ages and how to, how to, uh, what what do they call it? Destructure? I don't know. Uh, you know uh, the family itself. But I think one of the most important thing is how do we promote the value of a girl child? You know that is so important, and and um, uh, we need to work on that. Why girls are important? I have interviewed. Uh, I know I made a research survey once, interviewing so many fathers who have son and a daughter and asking them who do they like more or who do they love more 99 percent of the fathers say they love their daughter more than their son you know 99 percent of the fathers but it is the same fathers who do not or the same family who do not provide the equal rights or or, or the treatment between that daughter and the son but when it comes to loving it comes like 99% of the fathers told me they love their daughters more. But one of the reason also they said is because daughters um, uh, daughters get married, go to the husband's house. We don't know what kind of husband uh, she will get married to. So that the sympathy, you know, and and that's that's funny because we, we need to say that the girls are valuable themselves. You need to educate them. You, you, uh, you love your girls, but you rely her happiness uh, and a whole um, uh, life sequences on a stranger, you know, because get married and go and depend, think that the husband will, you know, she needs to get a good husband who will look after her instead of giving her those rights and capacitating her to be a complete human being, you know, who can take care of herself. So I, how do we promote the value of a girl child is I think extremely important and make families understand. Um, so, uh, you know, giving examples, even like the birth, I, I do recall when 20 years ago from now, uh, I was in New York at a Asia Society panel discussion uh, where the moderator 
during, it was about gender equality, at the last uh, sequence of the panel discussion said, I'm going to ask a question to each one of you and you need to uh, respond immediately within 10 seconds without thinking that whatever comes on the top of your head. And I was hoping it wouldn't be me who was the first, you know, but it so happened I became the first person that the question was, the question was 10 years from now, what do you want to see changed in your country or in your context, in the context that you work? We had to say it right from the top of my head. And the, the first thought that came to me was, every house rejoice at the birth of a girl. I want to see in 10 years from now, every house rejoice at the birth of a girl. So, but it's been 20 years now since I said that, you know, and we still have that discrimination. You know, girls are loved, but they are seen as a burden. So I think giving examples of young couples now who value the birth of a girl, who value, uh, who have been, who have had successful careers, <coughs> who have looked after the family and parents. <coughs> I think that's extremely important. How do we under make families understand that girls are, if not more, as valuable as boys? I think that's important. I'm stopping here. We have uh, lots of agreement in the chat that there needs to be involvement of men and boys in, in making these changes. Um, someone saying getting men and boys involved is so important, especially as we face so much blowback now on gender equality activities. Um, someone else said, indeed, involving men and boys in this fight is still needed, but despite efforts, they still see efforts as men bashing. Um, and then someone else is saying that education at school plays a really big role. The oh, fact yes. that girls only learn most of the time about men, authors, philosophers, and painters. It's such a shame we don't learn more about historical women. I think that goes to the issue of representation, right? Being able to see yourself. See, we have a question Absolutely. from Perry. Did you want to add something there, Bandana? No, absolutely. Education at school level, right from the primary level, you know, is extremely important, I think. I did give example of my grandson saying, but women are weak because he was the prince and he was saving the rescuing the princess who was weak and frail, you know. So that's the kind of stories we embed on, on young boys, you know, uh, or young girls, you know, and girls just want to be pretty and be a, a princess or get dressed up. You know, so I think uh, uh, that's very important. And that's something we reinforce, uh, re emphasize on um, in, in, in our constructive dialogues about, uh, about uh, developing educational curriculum, uh, you know, that does not um, uh, reinforce um, traditional stereotyping, uh, but, uh, but has a positive portrayal. Absolutely, we need, we need new stories and more representative stories. Did you want to unmute to ask your question or make your comment, Terry? Yes, good morning. And thank you, Alicia. Um, and I just wanted to make a comment and maybe a question at the end. And thank you, Bandana, for the, um, the, the presentation. Um, Alicia, I think this is indeed very important work that, that uh, Equality Bahamas is doing, particularly in this pivotal time when it seems as if CEDAW as a convention itself is getting um, um, it is getting a bit of a beating, people not really paying the attention it should, it's not being integrated as much as I think it should be as a fundamental part of feminism, as a fundamental part of women's, um, the women's movement, um, women's organizations, et cetera. But um, I think this particular uh, article, Article 5 is so relevant as Bandana said, because what I, as, someone who really believes very strongly about CEDAW or in, and in CEDAW. Um, what I often am challenged with, uh, people push back on me, is that the fact that there is no article in the CEDAW convention that speaks specifically to domestic violence or violence against women and girls. And I actually have, have to point out to people that not, it, not only is it, you're right, there's no specific article that speaks to it, but of course there are, um, there were general recommendations that were, that informed the, the, um, the, the, the convention and that CEDAW itself as a convention is not a static document as was already said, it continues to be evolved. And, but more importantly is that all of the articles have 
um, they, they each individually have or uh, illustrate how women are being discriminated against, are, where the inequality is in all of these articles. So there's not necessarily, and, and the linkages. So there's, you don't necessarily have to say violence against women and girls to understand mm -hmm. that it is prevalent. Um, but this article particularly, I do appreciate because it speaks to sex roles and stereotyping. And oftentimes when people say talk about that, they think about one community, right? They think about um, the, gen, the uh, LGBTQ plus community, and they don't really connect it to just sex roles, the roles of girls and boys, or the roles that are assigned to girls and boys from very, very young ages. And so the last comment I would make, I will make is, and that bandana um, referenced it is linking the CRC, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to CEDAW. I think it's important to have those conversations at the same time because children grow into adults. And if people start making, seeing the linkages between those two conventions and understand when you don't do, when, when it's not informative from the very inception, like, primary school and, and other places where you're debunking all of those traditional um, um, uh, roles of, of stereotyping, when you're not doing that at a very primary level, those things will permeate into young adulthood and beyond. And so getting at it, of course, in a um, language that is age appropriate, et cetera, is critical. So thank you so much for emphasizing this particular article and 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 raising the types of ex examples. Of, um, unfortunately, I had some connection challenges, so I didn't hear all of it. But raising the fact that I, I particularly like the example of the the football players and and persons who are you know revered in in very masculine roles, even though we have great women football players as well. But but the, the point is it depends on the culture and, and the country in which you're representing. But using those kinds of champions to illustrate how it is how they're living CEDA in their daily lives. And they may not even be thinking about it, right? They're just living and illustrating how important it is to make those subtle changes and emphasize that those things do make a difference. So thank you. I, I know I said a lot, I'm sorry about that, but thank you for um, this opportunity. Thank you for the, the sharing of knowledge and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Terry, great observation, you know, particularly I want to thank you for highlighting the fact that CEDAW um, uh, covers violence against women. As you said, you don't have to name violence, but from discrimination, violence evolves. So every article, of course, Article 5, I mean, I've been working on violence against women for three decades, and Article 5 is the key article where we address all forms of violence, you know, from sexual violence to rape to all other forms of violence, domestic violence, all other forms of violence. When we talk article one and two, we talk about legislations related to violence. So it's not that, of course, the convention was as um, um, uh, said by Marion, uh, crafted in 1979. I think I earlier made a mistake in uh, naming the, and it came into effect in 1981. But uh, it's, it's an evolving convention. And that is why we have these general recommendations that elaborate what we are trying to mean by those articles. So thank you for saying that, you know, that CEDO is a key instrument that addresses all forms of discrimination against women, leading to the kinds of violence they face. And it addresses the need for legislations, policy changes, strategies, programs, interventions, um, attitudinal changes for promoting the gender equality that it envisions. So Terry, thank you for your kind words, your observation and your emphasis on the, on the, on the key uh, instrument uh, uh, as CEDAW as a key instrument for addressing violence against women. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Terry. And that gives us a great opportunity to tell you that our next session is actually on Article 5. Yes, again, because this time we'll be focusing on the way that Article 5 is used to address gender-based violence. And for that session, we'll be joined by CEDAW committee member Rhoda Reddick. I'll put the link in the chat for you to register for that one that will be taking place in August, um, same day of the week and same time. 
Um, we do have two other questions in the chat and we have five minutes. So I'm gonna try to get us through this and, and so that we can close on time, Vandana. Um, first question, based on your experience, how do we overcome the perception that we are promoting competition when we're trying to promote women's involvement in non-traditional careers or roles? So how do, how do we get over the idea that this is competition by trying to bring this equality of opportunity in careers? I, I, I don't know if I get the question correctly, but what we are saying is we are encouraging women on non-traditional roles, you know, and that it's not a competition. That's what, you know, that's what we need to, is that what it means? Yes, that, that we're trying to move toward equality yeah. of, and instead of competition. Yes, how do we make that clear? Yeah, that I mean, I, as I said, I think we need to bring out more narratives and examples and stories of women. Um, again, let me go back to my own personal observation and example, okay? When uh, Nepal, uh, in 2015, November, Nepal, uh, uh, elected, Nepal nominated its first female president. She's the second president, but first female president, you know. And I was ecstatic because one thing is because we had never thought in my lifetime of advocacy that I would see a woman president in Nepal. So it's a great achievement just to have a woman president also, you know. But over the years, not much has changed. You know, just having a female president, um, a president does not mean there's going to be drastic change, you know, in women's issues. But what has changed is when I grew up, you know, we have a, like you all say Christmas, we have a special festival called the Sarah, the same. And we receive blessings from my elders. So when our elders bless us, if you are a girl, young girl, most blessings you get is, may you get a good husband, you'll be a good wife, you know, that's the kind of blessing you get. And if you are a boy, it is like, may you earn a lot, be you know, a leader, be a leader or a minister or a prime minister. That's the kind of blessings you get. So my joy was because now girls are going to grow up seeing a female leader as the head of the country, which is then they, they can desire. And even the boys can see that a woman can lead, have a topmost position, you know. So I, I, I think such narratives you know, nothing much may change, but at least girls are going to grow up that I can handle that. You know, that that's that's the kind of, uh, you know, another thing when you talked about competition, again, my own example, I remember when I first went overseas to Netherlands um, to do my postgraduate diploma on news and current affairs production, I got a culture shock because the professors first and foremost would ask me so many questions of a theory that they would present. In my culture, I had never been, uh, you know, we had to uh, memorize what had been, uh, what is in the course book, and then I would get good marks, but never taught to question, to reflect, to criticize as a girl, especially, you know. So when senior male professors ask you, this is what I think, but what do you think? What do you think? What is your different opinion? It was very difficult for me to give my opinion. You know, I, it, I found it even more difficult because at the age of 25, I realized I've never been taught to give opinions. It's always been like what, what you need to do is told. But whereas boys are always being asked their opinion, you know. So I, I, I realized that I could still have a different opinion from a senior male person and still be respected. So it's not a matter of competition, but it's a matter of your understanding your strengths and weaknesses, you know. Um, uh, my husband could be a very good cook and I could be a great scientist, you know, it doesn't matter. But understanding those weaknesses and strengths and trying to um, uh, work together towards equality. It's not a matter of competition. It's understanding your competency. It's understanding your strength and weaknesses and working towards a better future for everyone. That's what it should be. But we, have, we should have more narratives, more such stories coming out, I think. Yeah, I, th I think what the, the person asking the question to was getting at was this idea that this is equality is a threat to to men. Oh, okay. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, there, there's scarcity. And if women get more more jobs, then men will somehow have less or women are trying to unseat men and, and be at the top. Mm. And we hear a lot of that when we talk about oh, women's yes. rights. When we talk and about we have a women. saying, I don't know, we have a saying here where we use it quite very often, men of quality are not afraid of equality, you know? So 
if you are a confident man, you and if you, you know, especially we have to target at men having daughters as well. Don't you want them to be as equal as you, you know? So if you are a confident man, you are never afraid of equality. It's only inferior men who are not sure of their own capability. Those are the ones who are afraid of equality. So that's the kind of notion we should spread around. Be a confident man, be a real man, you know, and give space, equal space. Yeah, and I think one of the difficult things too, when we're having these conversations about gender equality and, and the difference between opportunities and access and, and barriers that are faced by women and men is that we, we're often having them in isolation and not talking about some of the systemic issues, some of the things like, like capitalism that are actually giving us these ideas that there is so little that you have to use whatever power and dominance you have and make sure that you keep it. Um, we're not really questioning so many of these these systems, you know, that we're left with right. many of us from colonialism. Um, we mm -hmm. really have to do a better job, I think, of integrating um, all of this and having conversations about the big picture, too. I we agree, have, Alicia, very well, yeah. We have one more question here. Um, how do you think the committee could push for a more gender sensitive curriculum in primary and secondary schools? Well, the, what the committee can do and what we have been doing, as I said, is when we have a constructive dialogue, when we assess the state parties' reports, the alternative reports that comes, we consistently and persistently um, include in our recommendations for the state party uh, to, to, to develop, to introduce a gender sensitive curricula and report to the committee in the next periodic report. So that is what the committee is doing. It has been doing that. I, I have reviewed so many recommendations. We've done that to many state parties. Now the role of the civil society is to look at that recommendation and to advocate and work together with the government to see that that is implemented. I think that is what is most important. You know, sometimes uh, the government are quite laid back in such issues. So if you think that is a priority issue, it is the civil society working in that area to pick up that recommendation. I have seen uh, many examples of how uh, advocacy based on CEDAW recommendations have, uh, have, have, have played a key role in bringing about many changes. So, as a committee, we will ask the state party based on our assessment to develop and introduce such gender sensitive curricula. We will persistently do it, but as a civil society who work in this area, they should pick it up and advocate and work with the government to see that that is implemented. I shared earlier in the chat, just a snippet from the concluding observations on the Bahamas and one of the recommendations from the CEDAW committee under article five is strengthen primary and secondary education on gender stereotypes, prejudice, and gender roles in family relationships. So the committee sort of tells you what to do, but not necessarily how to do it. And, you know, perhaps it is up to civil society, understanding the context, the culture, um, social patterns, as is um, named in Article 5, to really determine what would be the most effective way to do that. And of course, we know that means that we need to have a really close re working relationship with the government that can be <laughs> challenging in, in different spaces and at different times. Yes. Well, that is all that we have of the questions in the chat. And I think we reached everyone who wanted to contribute something. So thank, thank you everyone for your participation in this conversation. Many, many, many thanks to you, Bandana, for being here with us. I know that it's late for you. You're probably ready to just <laughs> call it a day. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise and your personal experiences. Um, just as someone who's living in Nepal, the way that you grew up, as well as what you've learned along the way and your role on the CEDAW committee. We really, really appreciate you taking this time with us on a Saturday night for you. Uh, thank you, Marion, for your assistance in coordinating this um, event as well as the entire series. Um, don't forget that we will have another session on August 20th, I think it is, the third Saturday in August at 9 a.m. Jamaica time, 10 a.m. the Bahamas. We will be joined by Rhoda Reddock to look again at Article 5, but this time the way that it is used to address the issue of gender-based violence. You can register for that one at tiny.cc slash cdaw5b.
So that's tiny.cc slash C-E-D-A-W, the number five letter B. Um, be sure to follow Equality Bahamas on all social media. We are Equality242 on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're looking forward to seeing you at the next session and hopefully before that, because we have some other things coming up for our LGBTQI plus people. We have a group therapy session today at 1230. And tomorrow we have a free yoga session at 8 a.m. And these are all Bahamas time, Eastern Daylight Time. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your weekend.